Can you imagine an earthquake so big and powerful and devastating that it took down a whole city and brought the beginning of the end of a global empire? I'm talking about the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, and we're gonna explore what happened. Many of us have felt seismic tremors or small earthquakes. Even fewer of us have experienced some of the larger ones like in Mexico City, Loma Prieta, or even Nepal. Fortunately, extremely large earthquakes like the 1960 Chile earthquake of magnitude 9.5 are rare. However, there are also earthquakes whose impact is so significant that it can change the course of history for an entire nation. Today, we'll take a look at the 1755 Lisbon earthquake that not only brought heavy damage and casualties to Portugal, but also led to the end of a global empire. In the early 1700s, Portugal was a thriving nation, and along with England, France, Spain, and to a certain extent the Netherlands, they dominated the seas in exploring oceans for new trade routes and new colonies. Prince Henry was an avid supporter of exploration and funded a number of voyages around the coast of Africa and became known as Henry the Navigator, even though he rarely, if at all, went to sea. Over time, Portugal established colonies in Angola, Mozambique, and even as far away as Macau, which is now part of China. All of this accumulation of wealth and influence came to an abrupt end on November 1st, 1755, when at 9.30 in the morning, a magnitude 8.5 earthquake struck 200 miles to the southwest of Portugal. This day was a religious feast day when churches were packed to celebrate All Saints Day. The strong shaking led to the collapse of many major structures, and within seconds, thousands of people perished from the damage and ensuing fires. To get away from the fires, many people ran to the hills and to the waterfront. Unfortunately, within half an hour of the shaking, a tsunami washed up the Tagus River and a massive wall of water slammed into the city's coastline. In all, at least 30,000 people were killed by the building collapses, fire, and tsunami in just Lisbon. Throughout the country, it's believed that the fatalities amounted to at least 60,000. Numerous churches fell on that fateful day in 1755. To this day, only one remains in ruins, and it's left this way in memory of what happened on that day. This is the Carmel Convent in Lisbon. The Lisbon quake was so devastating and the aftershocks continued for so long that many people fled to the countryside. Even the king refused to live in the city and lived outside the city limits in a wooden house and tents for the rest of his life. One of the consequences of the earthquake was how the king appointed the Marquis of Pombal to resurrect and reconstruct Lisbon. To do this, the Marquis sent out a survey to every parish in the country to determine how the quake affected different parts of the countryside. The survey consisted of not only the amount of local damage sustained by the earthquake, but questions about the nature of buildings that survived or fell, the water levels, and other observations pertinent to the earthquake. This is no different than the information that seismologists collect today to create shake maps, information that is critical in the engineering and design of buildings and infrastructure. The king also decided to reconstruct the downtown area from scratch, and he selected a design by Pombal that consisted of a grid of avenues, wider streets, and a seismoresistant building design that consisted of wooden cage-like structures to better absorb seismic waves. This was a remarkable achievement and is believed to be the advent of earthquake-resistant engineering. Lisbon wasn't the only place that suffered damage and casualties. Let's take a look at what happened elsewhere. Let's check out Setubal, one of the major cities that's only about 30 miles south of Lisbon. And we'll see what happened back in the old days. What I have behind me is Setubal, and this used to be a small little outpost 
trading post and fishing village. Now it's a population of about 100,000 in all the surrounding area. But in the old days, in 1700, it was about 10,000 people. And you can see how, because it's so low lying, that the tsunami washed up and created significant damage. And out of 10,000 people that lived here, possibly a quarter of the population was killed as that water slowly moved its way into the city. Tsunami observations from around the country and as far away as the Caribbean and Nova Scotia have helped modelers pinpoint the likely epicenter of the earthquake and the type of faulting that generated the resulting waves. Waves up to 20 meters high were observed at various locations along the south coast of Portugal and waves of 5 meters entered the Tagus River and struck Lisbon. Numerous records indicate that the sea rose and fell about three times in 15 minutes as this series of large waves swept along the coast half an hour after the earthquake shaking. The tsunami caught many people off guard as they had headed out of downtown Lisbon area towards the waterfront to escape the fires. In addition to the coastal flooding, the water pushed wood rubble into new piles that contributed to feeding the ferocious fires for several days. If you can imagine the chaos from the shaking, tsunami, and raging fires, this was an unimaginable disaster. Along the coast just west of Lisbon, there are also numerous boulders of different sizes weighing several tons that have been broken off and pushed inland by the 1755 tsunami. These are not just erosional features since some of the boulders are clearly out of place and even upside down. In addition, some of the inland sediments around them are characteristic of tsunami deposits and age dating supports the 1755 time frame. Finally, the tsunami boulders are found in an area that does not typically see large waves like those found to the north at Nazare. One of the things we have to remember is back in the day of the 1755 earthquake, a lot of the construction techniques and methods didn't have any kind of seismic code and actually used different materials from what is commonly used in the modern world. And for that reason, a lot of these buildings collapsed. Unfortunately, to this day, there is still a lot of material in old Portugal that relies on rubble and stone masonry, which is essentially, as you can see in some of these walls here, a combination of bricks and mud and random pieces of rock and stone or whatever's found in the local area. So with this kind of standard still in existence, many of these structures may not be insurable, or at least insurance companies may not be willing to take the risk to insure them for natural disasters like earthquakes or even floods. Until that changes, a lot of this structure will have to be self-funded by the government to rebuild after any future events 